Welcome to the Refuge Podcast, where we cultivate our faith in the shelter of God's word. I'm your host, Jennifer Elwood. This is going to be the first of what I hope to be many solo episodes, which will be biblical context deep dive into scripture. I have been studying like this for several years now, and it is time to start sharing this type of study method with all of you. And I am super excited to do it. So in my previous episode with Debbie Patrick, we talked about Psalm 34, 14 or verse 15, depending on which version you're reading, which says, turn from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it from the NIV translation. This will be our inaugural deep dive verse. So let's get going and nerd out together. The first question I ask before I consult anything other than just reading the passage is to examine my first thoughts. So without any other study, here's what I'm thinking. If I need reminders from God to turn from evil, it's probably something I'm doing more often than I think. And if God asks us to seek peace and pursue it, then we should be paying attention. So who wrote this book? who wrote this psalm, and who did he write it for? So the author was David before he was king of Israel. And he wrote uh, lots of poets. He was a songwriter. So the psalm was likely written as a song and collected into this book because it is a Jewish songbook. And just in case you didn't know, David didn't write all the psalms. He did write a bunch of them, but the psalms span many years of poetical songs written to corporately praise God. You can call it an ancient hymnal. So next, let's ask the question of what was the time period, the place, the original language, and the genre? So this is actually an acrostic poem that functioned as a song. So each verse began with the first letter in the Hebrew Bible, which is Aleph, and worked all the way down to Zayin, which is the last letter. And it is further divided into two sections. The first 11 verses are devoted to praising God, and the latter 11 verses are focused on instruction. And it was written, as I mentioned before, David became king and united Israel into one complete nation. And there's an introduction to the psalm that says it was by David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who then drove him away. So he left. So this is a little excellent clue that'll help us answer some further questions but also one that kind of got me a little confused. So I'm going to take you down the only rabbit trail I have planned for this episode. Um, You can see this piece of scripture from 1 Samuel 21. And the first thing I notice is at the beginning of the chapter, David goes to Nob. And this is just north of modern day Jerusalem. He's getting ready to flee. He interacts with Abimelech, the priest, but he doesn't act insane in front of him. He does, however, act insane in front of the king of Achish in Gath, which is in the next section of scripture. So I was kind of like, what is going on here? So I dug a little deeper into the halls of Google and discovered something really cool. Abimelech is it means father of the king in Hebrew, but it has also been surmised that this can be used as the title for a king. So the rabbit trail question is now cleared up. This is just also a general title for someone as it could be their name. And so we're moving on. We were talking about the time that David acted insane in front of the king of Gath and was sent away instead of captured because, you know, like, as we're going to get into, Gath is definitely a place that is not going to have a lot of love for David. (laughs) So uh, David's interaction with Abimelech, aka Achish, in 1 Samuel 21, 10 through 15, shows us that Achish is the king of Gath, the home of the now deceased Goliath, who David knocked down and beheaded not that long before. 
And when David showed up, the people there started singing about Saul killing his thousands and David his ten thousands and yikes. <laughs> David starts to act crazy because he's afraid. The king sends David on his way, but obviously this scene affected David because he wrote this song after the interaction, which is assumed to be written when he was hiding in the cave of Adalam, in case you were wondering. So on to the next question which was just, we just need to touch on for a sec here because we've already hit most of it in the previous rabbit trail. In the thread of the story, this is happening on the cusp of Israel receiving a king who will unite the kingdom of Israel and is described as having a heart after God's. David is living out a season of being hunted by Saul, the first king of Israel, until he dies. And David officially becomes king. And then his son Solomon builds the first temple. So here's where we are in the thread of scripture. The next question that I like to ask is, is there any cultural information important to understanding this passage? So there are like so many things I could say here, but I'm going to pick this one. Ancient Israelites were people who relied heavily on spoken stories and songs, not written down necessarily to keep the living God at the forefront of their minds. The Jewish people, even into today, are people who sing everything. Just go to a Kol Nidre service and you will know what I mean. The whole thing is singing and it's just absolutely beautiful. And so I don't know about you, but when I learn a song, I remember it literally forever. And God built this into the fabric of his people. And Psalm 34 is such a beautiful example of this. So now we're going to move on to asking questions of the key words that we find in here. So I usually use the Logos app if I'm on my phone or if I'm on my computer, I go to biblehub.com because, and there's loads of other places that you can find Bible language dictionaries, but those are the tools that I use and I recommend all the time. So after looking at several words in the verse, this is the thing that jumped out at me. Both of the verbs, turn from and pursue, are in the imperative form, meaning that they are commands. And this is kind of easy to gloss over in English. So these words, they are not a suggestion. They are actions that we need to take seriously, which was actually kind of one of my first thoughts about this passage. So. Sometimes you ask these questions and you're like, oh, yay, I kind of intuitively might have known a little bit of that. And that's that's the Holy Spirit at work. We cannot take credit for this. Just throwing that out there. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Is this verse found in other parts of scripture? Well, in this case, the answer is yes. It's actually paraphrased multiple times, but take a listen to 1 Peter 3.11. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. In fact, Peter, after writing, this was this was something Peter wrote about talking about how husbands and wives should feed each other and that we should not repay insults with insults, but with blessing. And then he quotes Psalm 34, verses 13 through 17. We can firmly trust this truth is worth repeating to others as well as to ourselves. So on to the next question I like to ask, which is, does commentary have anything interesting to say about this? I tend to consult some of the Bibles that I've collected that fo focus on uh, Jewish culture before I widen my search. But uh, this time, the nugget I'd like to share with you comes from Matthew Poole's commentary. This is an old school one. This was written in the 17th century but it has been regularly consulted since then. And I like his writing. It's very concise and it's very to the point, but sometimes it just expands and illuminates a little bit that I kind of go like, oh, oh yeah. And in this case, you'll see, it is so good. So his commentary says this, for the portion of the verse that says, seek peace, he says, this means to study by all means possible to live peaceably and quietly with all men 
avoiding grudges, debates, dissensions, stripes, and enmities. And then this is what he says about pursue it. Do not only embrace it, meaning peace, gladly when it is offered, but follow hard after it when it seems to flee away. And use all possible endeavors by fair words, by condescensions, and by the mediation or assistance of others to recover it and to compose all differences which may arise between you and others. So when I consider this passage in light of this urging, I am not likely to pass over these words lightly ever again. So now we've churned it all out. It's a lot. If you're like, oh, stop, it's a fire hose to my mouth. That's kind of what these episodes are gonna be because I know that you can take a lot in. I know that it's possible. I know you can do it. And um, this is the thing that I have grown into. And now it's time to deep, deep. Sorry, I'm just, I'm not even going to edit that. I'm just going to leave it in there. It's time to dig deeper personally and discern the bigger picture. So for, for me, what does this tell me about God? This tells me that he is serious about our peace. He commands us to turn from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. He knows this is hard, but he also knows it's good for us because he is love. He wants only good for us. So what does this passage tell me about me? It is so dang easy for me to spin my thoughts into a tizzy. <laughs> From my real life, I've struggled as we began the transition from summer back to school this year. Last year, if you followed it all along with my life, you know that last August, my life went from fairly calm to freaky chaos overnight when my youngest returned to school. It took months and months and counseling and loads of tears and tantrums, but also a lot of triumphs. And things over time eased up. Her bravery started showing up regularly. And when the first day of school came this year, she got out of the car with a smile on her face and has had one ever since. <laughs> but in early August of this year, I realized my body and mind were starting to rev up. I had butterflies in my stomach for no good reason other than not knowing how the school year would start. But by persistently pursuing peace, praying and asking God to settle me down, asking for his hand to calm my generiness and recounting his goodness were the things that I was able to hold on to. And that, my friends, brought me to a place of peace that I, in hindsight, can't explain other than it was him. So here's the last question. How has this changed me? Well, I am never going to read Psalm 34 the same again. And it's kind of funny because I have read Psalm 34 a lot. We actually named our deli taste and see Delhi bakery based on this psalm in verse eight so i've like read it a lot but what will stick with me now and forevermore whenever this song comes up is how good god really is and that even when it seems peace will never come like it feels complete completely impossible God honors and fulfills our pursuit of peace every single time. Friends, you will have to leave a comment and let me know how you thought this went. I know it's a lot to take in at once, particularly if you've never studied like this before, but I highly recommend grabbing the list of questions that I'll be using for these deep, site, deep dive episodes so that you can try it out yourself. And the link for that is in the show notes. It's pretty easy. It's a PDF and you can just like download it. So thanks for leaning in and learning with me. 
You've been listening to the Refuge Podcast, where we cultivate our faith in the shelter of God's word.